Welcome to the first lecture in Kinesis 3311. In this course, we're going to start out in muscle physiology. And so uh, this will really kind of set the tone for the rest of the semester. Uh, in each unit, we'll kind of start out in this very similar way, and we'll, we'll really set up kind of the basic structure and function of whatever system we're talking about. So here we're going to introduce the structure and function of muscle. Much of this will be a review, so we'll cover some of the very basic stuff that you likely learned in anatomy and physiology. However, we're going to introduce some new concepts, primarily fiber types, which are really of essence to the study of exercise physiology. So with that, let's get started in the idea of looking at muscle, and specifically muscle types. Okay? In general, we can say that the body has three types of muscle. We'll start from uh, left to right here. So if we think about uh, cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle is, of course, found in our heart. It is uh, the major source of blood movement in order to pump, and it is only found there. Our second type of muscle is smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is really going to be the main, uh, uh, one of the only main types of muscle that we're not going to spend a lot of time on here in this class. Smooth muscle, of course, is found in the walls of hollow organs, uh, and it is uh, primarily found in an interesting place known as uh, the blood vessels. So we actually have a, a researcher here, uh, Dr. Arce, who's interested in this idea of uh, the ability of smooth muscle to contract and relax and be able to regulate blood pressure, which we'll learn about that a little bit in the cardiovascular section. However, what we're going to focus on today um, and in the next several units is skeletal muscle. Right? Skeletal makes up a large portion of our body weight, 40 to 50 percent, and includes over 600 skeletal muscles uh, that um, uh, are found in all over different places and really provide several functions. Right? The major function that we think of as exercise physiologists is, of course, the force generation for locomotion, right? Being able to get up and move and perform exercise. Whether that's endurance exercise, where we're using it to generate force to run long distances, or resistance training, where we're trying to increase the amount of force we can do by resistance training. However, one other thing that we'll talk about and important to note is that our breathing is also regulated by muscle, and our diaphragm is the primary inspiratory muscle and will come into play in the last unit of this uh, course. Right? It's also important for force generation for postural support, so the ability to stand here is of course all regulated by my abilities of muscles to contract and keep me upright. Right? Another important aspect of muscle function is of course heat production during cold. Of course we live in Texas, so this doesn't happen too often, so we don't need it uh, very often, but one or two days out of the year, maybe, uh, of course, we'll get cold. And what happens when you get cold? You shiver. That shiver is called, uh, will actually produce heat, is why you do it, and helps warm the body. And last but not least, an, an aspect that I think is, is probably um, underrepresented or underthought of is the ability to communicate. So we have the ability to breathe and use air and move in order to generate communication and speech. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, muscle is incredibly important in both the study of physiology and um, as it relates to exercise in itself. So let's then look at some of the specific properties of muscle which make it uh, so perfectly geared towards um, understanding and, and uh, producing force uh, and uh, working through that in exercise. So the idea of uh, skeletal muscle is there's four main uh, properties that make it extremely special. One is that it is an excitable tissue. And what I mean by excitable, as you can see on the screen here, is, the, is that muscle has the capacity to respond to a stimuli. Not all organs have this uh, capacity, and in general when we talk of stimuli, we're really going to focus on action potentials and the ability to respond and contract when told to do so by nerves, which of course usually are coming from our brain. The other important part of a muscle is is that it has the property of contractility. What this means is, of course, is the muscle has the ability to shorten and generate a force uh, uh, in order to do that. Right? We're going to talk much more about this as the course moves along, about how we actually uh, are able to shorten and generate force. However, it is important. So ultimately, what we'll do is we'll link excitability and contractility. Right? So we have the ability to tell a muscle to contract, and then when it does contract, it generates a force. A couple other important 
parts of this is that muscle has an idea, a property of extensibility. This is the idea that muscles can be stretched and then return back to its original length. Same idea is not only is it extensible, but it's elastic, and this is the ability of muscle to recoil back to original left resting length after stretching. Of course, this is, these, both of these are important in exercise physiology as we talk about uh, its ability to both be deformed and stretched in different ways, whether that's through uh, contractions or uh, maybe through some type of motion in which we're turning and twisting and, and our muscles are able to uh, go back to its original uh, length and original shape. Right? One of the main parts driving this aspect of um, elasticity and extensibility is the connective tissue that surrounds skeletal muscle. Again, we should be relatively familiar with these ideas coming from um, anatomy and physiology courses, but in general, the skeletal muscle is surrounded by specific connective tissues which kind of uh, separate the muscle into different compartments. Right? If we think about it from the very end, right, uh, the ultimate goal is to bring all of the, these connective tissue parts into one thick sheath of connective tissue, otherwise known as a tendon, which connects to bone. This is important because, of course, when we contract or try to shorten our muscle, right, we're going to pull on that connective tissue. And in this case, when the tendon is attached to the bone, we're able to pull that bone and, of course, generate movement. Right? So if we then extend out, the tendon is actually um, made up of all three major types of connective tissue coming together. The first uh, major type is the epi epimysium, right? That's the Texas way of saying it, I like to say. The, the non-Texas way would be the epimysium. Either way, we'll, we'll go with either pronunciation. But this is a dense, regular, uh, dense connective tissue that surrounds the entire muscle, right? So when we think of things like uh, deep fascia, if you've heard that term, uh, there's you know, something called myofascial release, which has become more and more popular. What we're talking about there is they're actually massaging or working this epimyceum and trying to relax some of that. So that surrounds the entire muscle. On a second layer, we have paramecium or paramyceum, which is there to surround bundles of muscle fibers. These muscle fibers get their own specific name. We call them fascicles, uh, and they contain... Uh, numerous things. So these are, again, elastic fibers made up of a lot of kind of stretchy materials that surround groups of fibers. And they contain mainly uh, not only uh, these fascicles, but also are going to be where our blood vessels and our nerves are going to be contained. Last but not least, we have our last level of connective tissue, which is known as the endomysium or endomyceum. How have you heard it? Right? This is a loose connective tissue that ultimately surrounds individual muscle fibers. Right. This is going to also have a little bit of blood vessels and nerves and is going to uh, have one other important thing we'll discuss later on, but that's satellite cells. So you can just kind of store that away. The idea of satellite cells are, are in the endomyceum. Right. So again, we have these working all the way up. So we have our individual muscle fibers surrounded by endomysium. We then have a group of individual muscle fibers that are then formed into a fascicle that's separated again by the paramecium. And last but not least, all those bundles come together to essentially form an entire muscle, which is the epimyceum. And all three of those connective tissues ultimately come together to form the tendon in order to connect to bone. Right? I also have listed on here the sarcolemma. This is uh, kind of somewhere in between a connective tissue um, and part of the cell membrane. But I want you to just note that I put this in here because... Uh, at some point along the way, uh, the muscle physiologists had the idea that we needed our own name for the cell membrane. So you'll see this referred to uh, things as sarca. So we'll, we'll use that as an as a identifier for muscle in itself. So this is the outer layer of a muscle that kind of keeps all the muscle contents inside. This is a muscle cell membrane, otherwise known as the sarcolemma. We'll also see things such as sarcoplasm, which is the cytoplasm of the cell, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is a picture from your book that really just shows the exact same image. I, I, I like to pull things out of the book when I can, when they're really nice drawings. And, and as you can see, this, this kind of illustrates the exact same point that I just worked through, right? A tendon, uh, which then uh, is made up of all three connective tissues, the epimyceum, which then forms fascicles in the paramyceum, and last but not least, individual muscle fibers in the uh, endomyceum.
You can see here that they use the term fasciculus. That's the plural of uh, fascicle, and so uh, I'll be using that term uh, interchangeably. So fascicle is a singular, fasciculus uh, is multiple. Right? And then again, we can see that sarcolemma, which, which surrounds the entire muscle fiber. And as we can see, uh, also inside the muscle fiber, you'll see that we even have little bitty small bundles in there. No connective tissue in that per se. However, we can uh, actually kind of lump these into uh, nice little um, uh, round tubes inside of this that's known as a myofibril. Right? These myofibrils then can even be taken down one step farther and beautifully illustrated here into the sarcomere. Sarcomere is going to be our functional unit of contraction, and we're going to spend a lot of time on that here uh, in just a little bit. Before we move on, one other kind of image and idea of connective tissue. Again, what is it, what does it do, and how do we see it? Right? So the role is, is several, um, several parts. First, it's there to stabilize and support components of skeletal muscle. Right? This is important because it is stretchy. It is able to kind of add that uh, property of elasticity and extensibility into the muscle uh, to stabilize and support it. It's also going to surround muscle at an organizational level so that we kind of create groups of muscles, uh, groups of myofibers in the muscle. And this is important especially for large muscles so that we can kind of compartmentalize uh, uh, the muscle into smaller groups. And last but not least, uh, probably its most important part is it allows and aids the transmission of force, right? We're transmitting force by pulling and shortening the muscle which of course then pulls on the connective tissue, which ultimately pulls on the tendon and allows for locomotion. In the image here, again, this is just another way to look at it. Here what we have is what's known as a cross section of a muscle. So we took a muscle, cut it there, and we can see that each of the kind of round purple circles are indeed a myofiber or a muscle fiber in itself. Here, since we're relatively zoomed in on a microscopic level, we can really only see two of the uh, connective tissue components. Of course, we can't see the epimyceum, which surrounds the entire muscle. So what we can see is the paramyceum, which of course is going to surround a fascicle. As you can see here, uh, is kind of that connective tissue, also going to contain some blood vessels and nerves and surround uh, a group of muscle fibers. And then of course, if you were able to kind of zoom in and pick around each little muscle fiber, we can see the endomyceum as well. Okay, so now that we have a basis of how the structure of muscle is ultimately defined, let's get into muscle fibers themselves. Muscle fibers, as opposed to other cells, are a very unique shape. Right? The shape is a long tube. Right? We don't really have any other cell type like this in the body. Right? It has a unique shape that is not only a long tube, but an incredibly large cell in itself. As you guys probably remember from either biology or anatomy, most cells are so tiny that we can't see them with the naked eye. That's of course not the case with skeletal muscle, and indeed these muscles are so large, while they may be small in diameter, they're so large that some of them can actually stretch the entire length of a muscle. So you think about your quad, you can have a muscle fiber, uh, one single fiber go from essentially the top of your hip down to the near end of your knee. Right? So these are relatively large, and we can indeed see these with the naked eye. And indeed, although I'm getting a little older and need a microscope to kind of be able to see, uh, specifically part of my research goals is to actually look at individual muscle fibers so I can get in uh, with just a, a little bit of magnification and actually tease out individual muscle fibers from, uh, uh, from tissue samples. Right? So relatively large, large uh, um, both in size and in length. Skeletal muscles do contain the same organelles as all other cells, right? So that lumps everything in from nuclei to uh, mitochondria, which you're, you're going to learn uh, as we move along, or my favorite organelle. Uh, we can lump in the Golgi, uh, uh, rough ER, smooth ER, et cetera, et cetera. All those are found within the muscle. However, in general, and what you can see in the picture above is we actually have a couple separate special proteins that make up the majority of muscle. Those are actin and myosin and they are produce ultimately a striped appearance as we can see here. That's really one of the classic signs of muscle is having this striated or stripes appearance that's produced between alternating dark and light bands 
of these actin and myosin are thick and thin filaments. So what ha ultimately happens in a muscle is we try to cram as much of those actin and myosin in the middle and that pushes most of our organelles outside to the outer edges of this round tube. Including in that is our nucleus. And one of the important aspects that separates muscle from other cells is we have lots of nuclei inside muscle fibers. And as you can see in that top picture, these myonuclei are uh, shown in purple. That again, they're on the periphery. They've been squeezed out by these thick and thin filaments. And as you can see, each muscle fiber has multiple. So the bottom uh, muscle fiber has at least two visible in this picture. Same for the second one and even in the, the very top one. We see at least three myonuclei in that muscle fiber. So why does muscle need these multiple nuclei? The reason is because we have this huge long muscle fiber and if we think about the nuclei, they're the command center of the cell. That's kind of the idea is that they regulate all the kind of normal functions they contain all the DNA in order to regulate parts of the cell. Since our muscle cells are so huge, long, and large, we need multiple nuclei to essentially control each small, tiny little part of the muscle cell. Ultimately, we call that a myonuclear domain, the area in which that nuclei essentially controls. So when we have a huge cell, we need to have a lot of nuclei to control that domain in itself. As we kind of continue to move through the list, we'll see that one of the benefits, as we talked about a muscle, is that it has the excitability and contraction and skeletal muscle in itself. We are able to have it contract voluntarily. In other words, we can send a signal that tells it to contract, and as you might imagine, that becomes extremely important as for exercise. Again, as I pointed out, the cell membrane, also called the sarcolemma, uh, just uh, for muscle specifically, and I do want to talk about that it has a special feature in the sarcolemma. In that, as you remember probably from an, um, biology, right, the cell membrane kind of is just the outer circle. Well, not in muscle. That's what makes it a little bit different and why it gets its special name. And that's because the special feature is that it actually sends invaginations deep into the middle of that cell. So it's not just present on the outside of the tubes, but also has tiny little uh, uh, parts that go into, deep into the sarcoplasm of the cyto or cytoplasm of the mus muscle cell, and we call this the T-tubule. This is going to be import incredibly important when we talk about contract contractility and linking the action potential to the contraction later on in the course. So just want to put this idea of T-tubules uh, in your mind for now. Right? Above the sarcolemma and below kind of this basal lamina, as you see in the notes, but what you can really do is say the endomyceum, right, that outer layer that surrounds the muscle fiber, is the satellite cell. I hinted at this earlier, one of the important parts of satellite cells is they serve essentially to work as stem cells for muscle. Right? So anytime there's muscle damage or um, regeneration or some type of system where we need another nuclei. So maybe an example of hypertrophy, which you might think when a muscle gets larger, right? That area that each nuclei controls stays relatively the same. And so satellite cells are there to come in and add a new nuclei into the muscle cell in order to either replace or add in if a muscle cell gets bigger, then a new one would come in in order to kind of control that domain and keep that relatively constant. All right. So the last part that we'll kind of talk about as we work through the structure and function of muscle here and looking at truly the structure is looking at breaking into the exact parts of what causes these striations and then we're going to use this to ultimately build our model of muscle contraction. So again, here's kind of our classic picture. Here, this is actually an individual muscle fiber. This isn't a whole muscle. I could see how that could be confusing. How do we know it's an individual muscle fiber? Again, those satellite cells give it away. Just underneath the, uh, the epimyceum is our satellite cell or our muscle stem cell. So again, single cell can then be broken down a little bit farther than into our myofibril. Right? Our myofibril, again, alternating light and dark bands giving us that. And we can break that down and kind of zoom into one part. And that's what's known as a sarcomere. Right? The sarcomere is essentially often called the functional unit of skeletal muscle. Why? And that's 
That's going to be because as we work into how a muscle contracts, this is the part that's actually shrinking uh, and uh, getting shorter when we contract a muscle. Right? So what makes up a sarcomere? A sarcomere is essentially divided into uh, two parts by looking at thick and thin filaments. Our thick filaments have another name of them called myosin, and our thin filaments are made up of actin. So let's take a specific look at actin and myosin again. Uh, the, the way that these work is, we're going to start with actin, is each little red dot in the top image here is known as actin. It's our red circle, right? So what we do is we, put, we group these together um, in what I would consider and call kind of a pearl necklace. So we make one pearl necklace and then we actually have a second intertwined pearl necklace to ultimately generate what's known as actin or a thin filament. The important part of this is that it uh, connects to the z-line, the very edges of our sarcomere, right? So when we think about this, it's going to attach to the outside so that ultimately when we start to generate force, we're going to try to pull this in towards the center. It also contains an important aspect called the active site. This is where our thick filament or myosin is going to bind to, right? However, this active site is not usually exposed, right? We usually cover it up because as you know, if this is an actin site where we're going to try to generate contraction, right, for the most part, we stay in a relaxed state. We want to stay relaxed so that we aren't contracted and of course, no one wants a cramp or fully contracted muscle. That wouldn't be very comfortable, right? So what we do is we block that site by a regulatory protein called tropomyosin. So how do we regulate whether tropomyosin is covering or exposing the active site, we do that by another protein called troponin. Troponin has three subunits, right, and it essentially is a way to connect all three parts. One is troponin I, which holds actin. Unfortunately, I don't have a good way to explain how to remember that. You'll just have to remember it. The other two actually make sense. So troponin T means that it binds to tropomyosin. And then last but not least, troponin C is going to be important because calcium is going to be what's the molecule telling our muscles to contract. So troponin C is going to be the binding site for calcium. Our other filament, the myosin filament, this is what I would uh, call kind of a double-headed golf club. So it's long with two globular heads that has a hinge fit, uh, pivot point. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at that and we'll see that the golf clubs are going to flex back and forth. Right? The heads are made up of an enzyme called myosin ATPase, which is going to become important in actually de determining the rate of muscle contractions as we move forward. And then of course the tails are intertwined to, find, uh, to form a myosin filament. Right? So if we look at these, again, these are nice and big and are going to form our thick filaments. and these are going to attach into the middle of our sarcomere, right? So that middle, conveniently called the M line. So uh, uh, we can see that these, what I've done is include two other figures. These are from your books to kind of just show that these are the way they look in a nice zoomed out image, right? So we have our tail, which is of course being protruded in from the middle of our sarcomere and our globular heads at the end. And as you can see, right, we kind of lump these together uh, in a three-dimensional shape to make a very thick filament. Our actin, on the other hand, relatively small, hence known as the thin filament. And you can see each of the, the main parts of this, right? We have our actin or our kind of globular circles. Then we have our tropomyosin, which covers up that actin site. And then our three complex protein of troponin, which is troponin C, I, and T. Again, these were all made up to essentially make the sarcomere structure. Right? The sarcomere structure is going to um, give us that very striated appearance. Again, our sarcomere, our functional unit of skeletal muscle, and again, I've taken this picture out of your book if you want to kind of get your book out and, and get a little bit better zoomed in view than we are here. Again, a couple things that I want to point out. One, in this picture at the top, right, our, our actin molecules are in green or our thin filaments. And you can see they are bound to the outer edge of our sarcomere, otherwise known as our Z-line or Z-disc. This is a filamentous network of protein that serves as the attachment site of this. And ultimately our goal is when we contract is to try to pull these Z-lines towards the center. 
are myosin is in kind of the pinkish red color, and those are attached to the middle of the cell, otherwise known as the M line. Right? This is the proteins to which myosin and actin work, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but our goal here is to pull actin using our myosin towards the center. Right? We can also talk about uh, different uh, parts of this, sar this sarcomere based on essentially the color it is as we look at them. So the A band in itself is the dark band. This is, includes the full length of the myosin filament. Right? And so you can see that here in this lower picture, this is an a, um, a electron microscope view zoomed in on a single sarcomere. And you can see right, right in the middle, we can see that M line, the two dark bands on the outer edges, those are the Z line, right? Uh, and so the dark band that's pretty big in the middle is of course known as the A band. The I band is the lighter zone. And you can see this contains thin or actin myosins, ac actin filaments, but no thick or myosin filaments, right? And indeed this actually spans into two sarcomeres, right? So it crosses a Z line into the adjacent uh, um, adjacent sarcomere next to it. And then of course, as we've already mentioned, that M line is the proteins that run right down in the middle. So again, we get our nice striated picture. In the next slide, I'll leave this for you guys when you print out your notes. This is just for you to go in at some point in time later in the semester to go in and kind of review and be able to label each of these in a cartoon view to be able to understand it. This is going to close up our uh, look at the structure of muscle. And now what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to actually start talking uh, a little bit about the function and how our muscle fibers are actually made up to be specific in the way we want them to contract.